What is the heart of a champion? It's desire, dedication, determination. Overall, it's the will to win. You have to have the fundamentals down. You have to pivot in any given circumstance. You have to execute a perfect game plan. So when it comes to investing in your future, I choose Southeast Mortgage, champions of the mortgage industry. Southeast Mortgage, the official home loan lender of the Georgia Bulldogs. All right, that'll do it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right, at this time, we're going to welcome our head coaches. Joining us now is Ohio State Buckeyes head coach Ryan Day and Georgia Bulldogs head coach Kirby Smart. Um, We'll start with opening statements uh, with you first, Coach Day, and uh, just give us your sort of your overall experience. Uh, how has bowl week been for you, and, and maybe how does that compare to other bowl trips you've had in the past? Yeah, it's been a great week for our guys. Um, got down here Christmas night and um, have had a great week. You know, I think everything here has been very convenient for our players, um, you know, staying over at the Omni and then just making the quick trip over to Mercedes-Benz Stadium uh, right around the corner. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're at a bowl trip, you spend a lot of times on buses moving around. Didn't happen, uh, happen this week. We were able to kind of get in and out of places very fast. Um, our guys uh, in, in have enjoyed their time here in Atlanta, but uh, had a great week of practice and certainly looking forward to this game. All right. Coach Smart, same for you. Tell your bowl week experience. Yeah, it's a tremendous honor to be in this bowl game. I've been a part of this bowl game multiple times as a player and coach. I think Gary Stoken and his staff do a tremendous job. Uh, first class in every phase of it. Um, you know, our players have enjoyed Atlanta, a lot of them from this area. Um, very convenient, like Ryan said. You know, I can remember bowl games where it was 30 minute rides, 20 minute rides from location to location. You never deal with that here. Um, so the efficiency of things has been tremendous. Um, I think the players have enjoyed um, some of the events they get to go to. Uh, I think that's key from an experience standpoint. And, you know, get their mind off the game uh, some as well, especially early in the week. Um, but we've had a good week of practice and excited and, and ready to go. All right, thank you, coaches. All right, let's get into some questions. Raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone. Please give us your name and affiliation. And to whom you're addressing the question, we'll start right here in the front row on the right. Yeah, Brooks Austin, Dogs Daily. It goes to both coaches. Uh, the term physicality gets brought up a lot when Big Ten and SEC teams play each other. What does that term mean to you, and what does it mean to the success and the winning of this football game? I think physicality is part of this game, and uh, it's it's a major part of every football game. I mean, when you, when you look across the board, when you do studies on these uh, semifinals and final playoff games since the playoffs started, physicality at the line of scrimmage has been really critical. And you look across the board, teams that run the ball well uh, tend to win these games. Also, red area third down and explosive plays are indicators, but the line of scrimmage play and physicality, but you know, physicality can be a lot of different ways. It can be on the perimeter, it can be on special teams, um, it can be a lot of different venues, uh, ways of looking at it. And, and I got a lot of respect for both conferences because when you play in a bowl game, you get to watch the other conference all the way through. You get to see all these teams they play. And you have a lot of respect um, for the conference that you're playing. Um, they have great physicality in that conference, always have, and uh, we respect that. Yeah, I agree with everything Kirby said. Just, I mean, that's the way the game's played. It's the game of football, and you have to play physical. Um, and when you're playing in the CFP, certainly it's it's going to be the most physical game you've played all season. And um, the SEC is, is, you know, and the Big Ten coming together, like you said, for years, uh, two of the most physical conferences there are out there. So um, it's everybody on the field. It's, you know, like you got the perimeter game out there. You have special teams. You have the, the game in the trenches. You know, you have to win your one-on-one -on -one battles. And 
and uh, that's what this game's all about. It's about running around and hitting people. So, um, you know, that's that's to be expected in a game like this. All right, take our third row on the far right. Bill Rubino, it's Columbus Dispatch for Ryan. Kind of related to that, you used the term violent a couple times yesterday, which struck me. Um, how, I mean, I get the sense that your team takes that personally, the the idea that you feel like you've got to prove that physicality, that violence. Can you just kind of address that? Well, uh, again, you know, playing in the CFP, you know, you're going to be playing football at the highest level, and, and this is going to be an unbelievable env uh, environment and electric atmosphere and, and uh, you know, playing in Mercedes Benz and, um, you know, again, playing in the CFP. It's, it's going to be that type of atmosphere. You know, our guys uh, know that and understand that, and, and that's, you know, what you're going to get in a game like this. So, um, you know, our guys have been practicing that way and preparing that way so that uh, you know, we can play our best football. But we know that uh, that's the type of game it's going to be. All right, next question, halfway back on the right side. Yeah, Austin Ward, uh, Rivals and 97.1 The Fan. Um, Ryan, I know that you don't necessarily consume a lot of Ohio State media, but did you make an exception for Paris's story, and what did you think of it? Uh, Paris Johnson is um, just a tremendous young man, and I, I did read his, his letter. Uh, I think that's why we get into coaching. I think in today's day and age, there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot that goes into it, but uh, to uh, spend time recruiting Paris and during that, you know, like he said in his letter, uh, you know, Urban started recruiting him, and then uh, I, you know, I came in and kind of took it over, and, and then. Paris, you know, and his mom went on that whole journey to go, you know, see a lot of different schools, but ended up back at Ohio State. And then to see his growth, what he's done on on the field, off the field, his impact at Ohio State has been tremendous. And that's that's the reason you get into coaching is to have an impact on young people. And winning just allows you an opportunity to do that more and more. And uh, you know, proud of him. And I thought it was well written. All right, next right here in the front row on the right, uh, Evan Kroll, Dogs Daily. This question goes for both coaches. These two programs have a lot of history, um, and they are often in the same circles, recruit the same caliber of players annually in the top five, but haven't matched up in a while. What does it mean to both of you to finally be able to step in between the lines and have these programs face off against each other? All right. Coach Smart, with you, please. Well, I'm excited for our kids and our opportunity. The two brands of both programs speak for themselves. I think uh, everybody in the country knows the kind of football they've played and we've played um, here recently. And um, it's really about them. It's not about uh, us as coaches. It's about the opportunity for the players to go out and play in what's going to be an incredible environment. And that's what you choose to go to Ohio State or Georgia for, is to play in games like this. So I'm excited and happy for them. And, and I have so much respect for what Kirby's done and what he's built and, and um, you know, winning the national championship last year. And certainly his team's played unbelievable this season. So, um, you know, when you look at the beginning of the year, you say to yourself, okay, where, do, where are we going to see ourselves in December? Um, and this is the exact situation we saw ourselves in. And we, and we knew that Georgia would be right here, and, and they do an unbelievable job of recruiting and coaching and playing. So, you know, here we are. All right, next question, all the way back on the left side, please. Yes, uh, Dom Tiberi, WBNS TV in Columbus. Uh, for both coaches, beginning with you, Coach Day, what concerns you the most with the Georgia defense? On the other side, Coach Smart, what concerns you the most with Ohio State's offense? Yeah, um, anytime you get to this level of football, you're, you're going to be playing against uh, complete teams, and, and uh, Georgia's defense is complete. They uh, have really good players in the back end, very, very talented, highly recruited, and been de developed at a high level with tremendous scheme. And then uh, when you go into the front, um, athletic linebacker who's going to run sideline side to sideline in their front is powerful. So, um, you know, you see the statistics, you see the way they've played all year. So they're a complete defense. but. You know, when you get to this level of, of the CFP, that's what you're going to get, and, and that's the biggest challenge. So, uh, you know, we have to execute at a high level. All right, next one was over here. Okay, yep, there we go, back here. Yeah, Clay Hall, ABC6, Fox 28, football fever in Columbus. To both coaches, could you um, <clears throat> talk about the standards and expectations of your respective programs and how you've adjusted to the, the pressure uh, that's involved uh, with that uh, task? Yeah, there's always been pressure. So I don't know that there's an adjustment to pressure. There's just as so much pressure from year one to year seven. Um, the expectations don't change. Um, we embrace that. Um, the standards that are created are created through the players that play there. And uh, we've had a really good 
uh, leadership kind of uh, over the last six, seven years, and they've created a standard for the younger players to emulate. And that's going on now. You know, I talk every day to our guys about if you're a freshman or sophomore, find the guy you think works hardest and does it the right way and emulate him, and this success will continue. Um, there's no entitlement, and uh, you work really hard at what you do. But the, the standard doesn't change. Players change. And uh, each year, maybe your identity changes, but the standard doesn't change. Yeah, um, same thing. I mean, you know, the expectations at Ohio State and Georgia are, are the highest level, and, um, you know, we embrace that. Our players embrace that. That's why you come to Ohio State is to, you know, be in situations like this and play in games like this and go compete for a national championship. So um, we talk about that in recruiting. We identify those who um, look to achieve that and want to be elite, and then – um, like Kirby said, in, in your team, you know, you, you build that culture of, you know, passing down a legacy to the younger guys so that that continues. And, and that's been going on here for, for a long time at Ohio State. Okay, third row on the right. Mark Weiser, Athens Banner Herald. Kirby, we saw you and your players doing yoga at the end of practice yesterday. Is that part of your typical game week? And what do you see as the benefit of it? Yeah, we've done that every Thursday the entire season. And uh, we didn't want to change that uh, tradition. The players have embraced it. We, we've cut practice on Thursday throughout the year um, to go down on their GPS numbers. And um, so Carolyn Ward, who her husband's one of our physicians, team physicians, she does the um, yoga. And the players um, really like it. It makes them feel better, uh, a little more refreshed. Um, so I think it's important recovery standpoint. Over here, fourth row on the right. Uh, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Ryan, we saw Mayan back at practice yesterday, and he wasn't feeling well early in the week. How, how's he look? How's he? How's he feeling the day before the game? Yeah, back to practice yesterday, so uh, he'll, he'll be ready to go. Hey, Allison, Master Angelo, WSB in Atlanta. Kirby, we keep talking about how some of your guys have been here before. So what have you seen from the guys that have kind of been through this playoff run? And maybe we've noticed maybe leadership, characters that you've seen from them this week. Yeah, I think the guys that came into the season as leaders that had played quite a bit, they've been that way throughout. I don't know that it's been any different um, for the 28 days since our last game. Um, they certainly uh, have a lot of experience, but – you know, I don't know that there's an Ohio State player or a Georgia player right now that doesn't have experience that's played in 12 or 13 games. Um, the season is your experience. And coming into the season against Oregon, I would have said we were an inexperienced team, but we have experience now and so do they. So you draw on those experiences of playing your uh, interconference rivals, and uh, we, we both teams have done that. Third row on the left here. Doug Maurice, Cleveland.com for Ryan. I know you're focused on your game, but there's two Big Ten teams playing in semifinals. That idea, what have you seen from the Big Ten in your time as a head coach in, in terms of the overall level of play, and what do you think it means for the Big Ten to have both Ohio State and Michigan in semifinals this year? Well, I think it's uh, very important for uh, the conference to have two teams in, in the CFP. Um, I think the level of play in the Big Ten has uh, improved you know, over my time uh, as the head coach. Um, you know, week in and week out, you have to bring it. And the challenge is that you play nine conference games in the Big Ten. So, um, you know, there's very good coaches, um, very good players, the very physical conference. And so, you know, you have to be able to sustain throughout November because of the nine conference games. And, and you know, for, for some teams, they play a non-conference. That's really a 10 conference games that you play. And with the physicality of the conference, uh, I think it's it's deserving that two teams in the CFP. All right, next we'll go front row on the right. Yeah, Brooks also with Dogs Daily. It's for both coaches again. You guys are obviously strangers on the field, but you bump heads all the time on the recruiting trail. C.J. Stroud most notably, Kojo Antwee, Damon Wilson as of late. What have you learned about your opponent, I guess, on the trail and uh, maybe something you admire or have uh, taken from them? All right. Coach Smart. It's a tough question. I, you know, when you're recruiting against someone, you don't take much from them in terms of, uh, uh, you know, style of play or anything else. Respect would be the number one thing that I have uh, for people that we recruit against and play against. Uh, you mentioned C.J. Stroud. What a 
what a tremendous young man. I was so upset. And my assistant, when I had to fly all the way to California to go out there, I was like, are you sure we're going to have a chance? And we went out there, and uh, it wasn't my favorite travel trip when I had to go all the way to Cali, but it was worth it when you got to sit down with that young man and his mom because he was very impressive, and he returned that trip to come back and, and see us. And usually when you get them on your campus, that means you have a shot. And uh, I certainly enjoyed getting to know him and the relationship with him because of the young man he is. Um, but as far as you know, what you learned about the other team and other, other programs we're recruiting, I don't think there's a lot there. Right. Coach Day? I would just say I, I think um, you know, Kirby and his staff do, do a great job of, of working at it. You know, I think when um, you, know, you have such great players in the state of Georgia, you know, um, the easy thing to do would be just to uh, assume you're going to get those guys. They, they don't do that. They, they work really hard at it. They grind at it. They uh, no stones unturned. So when you're when you're recruiting against Georgia, I mean, you got to bring it, and, uh, and they do a great job of that. All right, all the way back on the left here. I'm a, I'm Finn with with Omni Hotels and Resorts. Uh, for many high school students, playing football at a college level is a dream opportunity. What advice would you give to upcoming recruits looking to be recruited by a big program? Coach Smart? Play hard. Get seen. Uh, you know, it, it's important that you understand what it takes to play at this level. I, I wouldn't kid you and tell you that it's going to be all intangibles because there's a physical nature of these two teams that some high school student athletes aren't blessed with. And they can do everything right, and they may never play at Georgia or Ohio State, but they can play somewhere. And there's enough football out there that everybody has an opportunity if they present themselves the right way. and they work hard enough and, and persist. I mean, nobody thought Stetson Bennett would be where he is today when he was coming out of high school. Coach Day? Agreed. Um, you know, I think in the recruiting process, sometimes we call it Disneyland recruiting, like everything's going to be great when you go to school. The truth is there's twists and turns along the way, and everybody has their own journey. So that a um, you know, big part of going through the process of college is you know, working through adversity and tough times. and so. Um, I think a big part of going through the process is choosing a school uh, that's going to develop you at a high level in all areas of your life. You know, certainly there's the football part of it, and, and that's a big part of, of the, the experience, but there's a lot more to it than that. So um, in today's day and age, there's a lot of new changes and a lot of things going on, but focus on the things that matter I think is critical. All right. Middle row on the yeah, yeah, question for Kirby, kind of Riley Dog Nation. What have you been able to see from Ladd and Warren McClendon this week, and how beneficial have these last four weeks been for Amarius Mims and A.D. Mitchell? Uh, they've been great for those two guys. You know, Amarius has gotten to play a ton this year, so he's been a rotational player, and uh, mainly for the reason that if you lost somebody, you could go in and play. If you remember, Jamari had the situation uh, some last year at the end of the year and even in the uh, championship game where he had to move positions and play with some injuries and do some things to help us out. So, And we're still hopeful to get Ladd and Warren back. All right, next question right here on the far right. Coach Kirby, Caleb Spinner, Scarlet Gray Sports Radio and Buckeyes Now. You were neck and neck in recruiting C.J. Stroud. What attributes did you see in him and what does he share with Stetson Bennett? Well, he's a tremendous leader, and I think when you play that position, you better be a leader. And uh, he, he's he's, uh, he's very quiet then, um, very humble, uh, but very talented. And uh, you know, he, he has great vision down the field. He has great athleticism uh, to take off and run, and that's something he and Stetson both share. Um, you know, they had two different kind of paths. You know, CJ was highly recruited. CJ got to play relatively early in his career. And uh, they both had success. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the way that both of them treat their teammates and make it more about their teammates than themselves. All right, midway back on the left, please. Patrick Murphy from 247 Sports. For both coaches, you guys have had to deal with injuries throughout the season, next man up mentality. How does that change when you're at this point playing in the college football playoff when you need guys to step in for, for those guys who may be out for these games? Yeah, I don't think it changes. Um, you know, when you're into this, this part of the season, you certainly have a month to uh, get some guys healed up. But, but you know, that's, that's college football. You, know, you can't pick up somebody on waivers. You know, you got you to develop young players and bring them along. And, and this, this time has been great because bowl practice is very similar to spring practice where you can get young players a lot of uh, reps and a lot of good on good work. So 
you continually use this time, the spring practice, the preseason, to build your depth so that uh, when you need to fill a guy, you know, or fill a spot, you can do that. And you know, this time of year, there's always those opportunities for, for players to do that. So it doesn't change. Yeah, I don't think it changes. Okay, on the aisle here on the right. Uh, Tim May, Letterman Row. I'd like both of you guys to address this. You're both leaders uh, in your profession. You've had teams get to the college football playoff several times and stuff. Uh, what is the fair, you think, remuneration that players – should be looking at maybe in down in the future for playing in these games, sharing in basically the wealth or whatever you want to call it, a bonus, whatever you want to call it. I, I would think you were probably both before. What do you think would be a fair number? I don't think you can put a number on that. I don't think it's fair for me to sit here and assess that number without studies and values. I do think the NIL, NIL opportunities that our players have gotten have been tremendous for them in terms of creating a, a lot of opportunity for themselves um, and a chance to help their families. I think the CFP does a tremendous job who gives a, a really handsome check to the families to travel to these locations that are tremendously hard to get to. And you're talking about two night minimums and you're talking about New Year's Eve. Um, and those are things that I know when I was a player, the parents weren't afforded. So it's come quite a ways, to, but to put a number on that, I'd, I'd be remiss to try to answer that right now. Coach Day? Yeah, same thing. Um, you know, to try to wrap my mind around how much that is or what that should be. I mean, I do think there should be something for them, for sure. And I do think what they're doing now is great. But I know moving down down the road, there should be more. It's just, you know, how, how can I possibly say a number? I wouldn't be speaking ignorantly. All right. Left side on the aisle, please. Allison Mastrangelo, WSB in Atlanta. This is for both coaches. What does the eve of the semifinal game look like for both teams besides the walkthroughs what are you guys doing together to get ready for the game coach day start with you we, we we'll keep our routine the same we, we've tried to keep this week uh, like a game week uh, and less like a bowl uh, week so um, you know like you said we have our walkthroughs we have our meetings um, uh, we have our our night together on friday we call it best fridays in football and uh, it'll be a long day um, you know getting ready for this game at eight o'clock kickoff so um you know, we try to do the best we can to keep in the routine the same, and uh, and that's meetings, walk through over at the stadium, and then uh, we come together for dinner, movies, uh, watch some football, and uh, then get to bed. Yeah, very similar. We keep the same routine. We keep it home and treat it like a uh, a road game in terms of we would be arriving today. We want them to have a mindset of they arrive today. That's one of the hardest things psychologically to uh, prepare your team for from being in the same place for six, seven days, sometimes in the same room. So psychologically, we try to do some things to help with that. And then we treat it like um, we arrived, we go do a walkthrough, uh, we do a movie, and uh, prepare for a big day tomorrow. Right over here on the left. Yes, Dom Tiberi, WBNS TV. Coach Smart, uh, wh what is your biggest concern with the Ohio State offense? And is this the best offense your defense will face today? That's hard to answer that in terms of is it the best um, that we face today because we haven't faced them. You know, when you look at them on tape, you certainly see the talent. It, it kind of oozes off uh, uh, the tape, especially a wide out quarterback position, um, two really good protectors, um, and they, they got talented players across the board. Ta a tight end who I have a lot of respect for, I think is one of the best tight ends we faced all year. So uh, they got a guy that can distribute the ball and get it to them. Um, so it's a very, very talented team. When you talk about concerns, it's, it's trite expression, but it's the same concerns every game we play. How are we going to play? You know, what are we going to do in terms of execution, uh, playing the ball in the air? There's going to be one-on-one -on -one matchups all over the field. You got to win those one-on-one -on -one matchups. And uh, when you're playing Ohio State, you got to be disruptive. You know, you, you got to affect the quarterback some kind of way. Because if you don't, he's very accurate. He's a, a very accurate passer that knows where he's going with the ball. And when you give them free access with a, with a quarterback like that, they can wear you out. So, um, but most games come down to the same thing. Turnovers, explosive, red area, third downs. I mean, it's what the greatest indicators are winning. All right, midway on the right. Uh, Mike Griffith, uh, AJC Dog Nation. Uh, Kirby, last year I asked you and Nick Saban this question at the championship game, Coach Day, if you could answer uh, in the NIL transfer portal area about this model, uh, the disadvantages that, that you have preparing for a game while maybe other teams are 
work in the portal or recruiting more aggressively. Do you think this is a, a sustainable model, uh, what you're dealing with right now with the transfer window, uh, as well as uh, the NIL dealings that are taking place for both coaches? Yeah, it's sustainable. I don't, I don't think there's any question is it sustainable because there's nobody that's going to weep and cry for the teams that are playing in the playoff because they're playing in the playoff. There's nobody that feels sorry for us. I mean, we get advertisement galore on ESPN. We get opportunities like this. We Our kids get to play in front of the largest viewership. The, the, the value you get in that in terms of recruiting uh, or transfer portal, if that's what you choose to do, then – you get, you get plenty of time to do that. Uh, everybody has time demands that plays in bowl games. And if you're not playing in a bowl game, you probably got other problems that you're concerned with too. So the model is what it is. Um, I think we can all complain about it and say there's things that I wish were different. Um, but it is what it is. And I don't have the answer or solution that says what's better. I agree well, with everything Kirby said. You know, the best recruiting is winning. So, um, you know, I think that's – one of the best things about being in this situation is you get all the exposure for recruits and their families to see you, know, you come to Georgia, you come to Ohio State to go play in the CFP. Well, here we are. So, um, you know, I, I think when, when you make decisions on changing things or moving things, the ripple effects don't get recognized for at least a couple years down the road. So early signing day, portal, NIL, all these types of things, you don't, you don't see them shake out for a couple years down the road. So I just, I always caution about changing again and keep, continually you know making all these changes because it just disrupts how things are being done so uh, you know I just as we move forward we have to make sure that we're really smart about the decisions that are made and the changes that we make third row on the left here please Doug Lee Maurice Cleveland.com for Ryan and then for Kirby as well when you have multiple weeks to prepare a game plan in a situation like this what are the similarities and differences to when you're preparing a game plan in a week's time during the season in terms of getting with your staff and building what you want to do on game day? Yeah, um, you know, for the, for the bowl structure that, that we use, um, we, we spend the first, time, first part of the bowl month working on fundamentals and just good on good and really don't dive into, into the game plan until we start to get a little bit closer uh, towards the game and then, and then try to treat it like a game week. Um, you obviously have more time to look at your opponent and get organized and um, you know look at the things that they do. But then you can also get to the point where you can overdo it. It, it gets similar to you know the first game of the season. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to fundamentals and who's going to play harder, who's going to execute you know in, in, uh, at the highest level. But uh, we try not to you know start the game playing too early because then you know you start to you know get too much involved with the scouts and, and you don't get good on good work because it'll come down to fundamentals. Yeah, very similar to Ryan. A lot of it, it hinges on where, where Christmas falls uh, and where your bowl game falls or your playoff game in that, in that situation because you're going to have a time there that you'd like to get a little break. Um, I think the psychology of the players after 13 games, 14 weeks, you got to be careful. Um, they got to want to play, and I think it's assumed um, that kids just want to play in bowl games or CFB. And, uh, you can wear, wear kids down. You know, they're not professional athletes. They have more burdens on them in terms of academic requirements, uh, and they're younger. So we try to do a good job of filling breaks in with hard work and sell them on the plan from day one and tell them how those 28 days are going to look and then try to go do it better than the other team does it. All right, midway on the left, please. Maria Martin, 11 Alive here in Atlanta. Kirby, this is for you. When you think about how Stetson has grown and developed within your program, what's the biggest thing that you reflect on and what you're most proud of? The biggest thing that what? That you reflect on and what you're most proud of in his growth and development. I, I, I'm most proud of the fact that he was persistent and he, he stayed the course and didn't, you know, jump ship when he was two or when he was three. Um, he stayed the course and stayed with us. I mean, I'm very grateful for that persistence and resiliency he showed uh, and his belief in himself that he showed. Because uh, I don't think any of those qualities had anything to do with myself or Coach Munkin or anybody else that was involved in him. They were traits within him that he loved Georgia and he wanted to prove that he could play at Georgia. And he created his own story by doing that. Okay, middle, uh, right here, third row on the right. Anthony Dasher, UJSports.com. Uh, Coach, another uh, steps in question. Uh, how has his practices been leading you know, the days and weeks leading up to this game? And as his head coach, what kind of comfort level does it give you knowing he's been through so much in his career, played in this thing obviously last year? 
He's been very consistent in his practices. Um, you know, you, you worry sometimes when guys go off to events and award shows, the walk-on award, the, uh, the the Heisman finalist, and doing all those things. But you know, they don't affect the guy that's 25 years old probably the same way they do a kid that's 18 or 19. He's very grounded in what he does. Uh, he's had great work ethic. Uh, I think the quarterback position is easily the most critical factor in a game because the way offenses are now, they put so much decision making on the quarterback, pre-snap, post-snap. I mean, everything is on the quarterback. So both these teams got really experienced, really proven guys who make good decisions. So when you have that, you're right more than you're wrong. And uh, that creates, usually creates scoring. So uh, I'm very grateful and thankful that we have a guy like Stetson who's played in games. Okay, same spot over here on the far right. Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch for Ryan. If you had beaten Michigan, you knew you would be in the playoff. The fact that you had to go through those days where of uncertainty and, and you know, misery and all that stuff, how much do you think that will help you in this game that you had that scare and maybe more gratefulness that you're here? I, I think at the time it certainly gave us um, an injection of energy and excitement uh, for sure coming off of that weekend um, and then into that week and then and the next week it was a range of emotions and um, allowed us an opportunity to have great energy and great focus and uh, an edge during the month of preparation for sure. So we'll see. I mean, we'll see uh, tomorrow night. We'll see where we're at. But um, I, I'm really uh, pleased with the way we've practiced, um, how our guys have gone at it. You know, we've, we've had a lot of physical practices. And so, um, you know, we have something taken away from you. Um, it does give you a little bit more of appreciation for what it is, and um, you know we'll see how we play. But it has been a great month. All, right. All the way back on the aisle on the right side, please. Hi, uh, Jared Smalley from NBC in Columbus. Ryan, for you, in the days and the weeks since the last game of the season, you and some of your players have referred to the amount of pressure that you felt in that final game and the way it may have affected the performance in that game. And I'm wondering the message you've had to your players to avoid the word pressure and to try to get them to play loose and to their most natural athletic ability in the biggest game of play? Well, I just think, you know, you go back to your training. You know, you can't focus on things like that. You know, what it comes down to is just playing, um, you know, hard in practice and then going back on your training once you get out there and playing um, physical with your teammates. And, and uh, There's going to be good plays. There's going to be bad plays. But just going out there and looking up the scoreboard at the end of the game, um, and that's what we're going to do in the game. We're just going to play as hard as we possibly can. There'll be ups, there'll be downs, there'll be twists, there'll be turns in this game, but uh, play as hard as we possibly can. And, you know, you can't worry about things like that in a game like this. All right, right here on the second row. Tyler Danberg, Scarlet and Gray Sports Radio. Coach Day, how has practicing at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this week allowed you and your team to get accustomed to the venue? Well, it's a great stadium. It's a great venue, uh, beautiful stadium. Um, and being there for the week is, um, you know, what you try to do is you try to make it your own. You try to say, okay, this is, this is the Woody right here. This is where we come out and we run out of the Woody every day. And, um, you know, you try to make it a game week. You try to make it as much home as possible. Um, I just think, you know, you, you practice it indoors uh, for the whole month and then you go there just – throwing and catching, uh, you know, the punts, things like that, the contrast against the ceiling. So it takes a couple of days. But um, but other than that, you know, it'll, it'll be a lot different with a, with a packed house uh, tomorrow night. All right, well, we've got time for a few more. We're going to go next right here on the far right. Caleb Spinner, Buckeyes now, Scarlet and Gray Sports Radio. To both coaches, this could be your final appeal to recruits in terms of what your guys are able to do on the field. What are you looking to, to send them in terms of a message of why they should come to your school? Right. Coach Smart, start with you, please. Um, I don't really think of it as a recruiting appeal. I think of it as a service to the kids who are with us and uh, the guys that are with us and have given so much. And I look at guys across the board, whether it's Cedric Van Pran or all these leaders, Kenny McIntosh, who, who waited his turn behind all these phenomenal backs. And uh, I look at it as a, an opportunity to go out and play well for them. You know, most of recruiting for this season is, is done. I know you're always looking to the next year, um, but, you know, what those kids see in one game, it'll be a small window. Uh, I do think it's important that uh, we do this for the guys on our team, not necessarily for the recruits. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would say recruiting never ends, but this, this game is about these players.
One more, one more. We'll get there. Ryan, uh, Nathan Baird for, from Cleveland.com. For Ryan, just you talked about that, you know, ending the season the way you did, getting to now. Anything that you learned about this team through that process or any, any individuals that sort of revealed themselves as, as being um, different or having, you know, a new leadership qualities that helped you, you know, push to this point? Well, I think you know, you know who the leaders are and you know, um, you know who the guys are that we turn to. Um, and, and I think those guys have done a great job. They've, they've had a voice, um, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm gonna point one or two guys out because we got a, a great group of guys. And um, again, uh, you know, at this point, there's not much more to talk about. Uh, we, we've had a great month. The guys have done a really good job. And so, so now it's time to go play the game. All right, time for maybe one or two more. Where are we going next? Next question. All right, over here on the far left on the aisle. Rob Mickle, Big Ten Network. Coach Smart, when you look at the Ohio State wide receivers, what do you see from Marvin Harrison Jr. and the talent and the depth of that group? Elite ball skills, playmaking ability. Those guys grew up under a system of wideouts that were just tremendous. And you look at it and say, if I get to play behind some of the guys they've had, you know the training they've had. You know who they've been able to watch. And uh, across the board, they've got size, physicality, ball skills, vertical speed. Um, all the qualities you want in wideouts. They, they, they recruit wideouts at a high level, and you see why when you see the guys they're playing with now. All right, we'll take our final question midway back on the right, please. Yep. Bill Trochi of Sporting News this is for Kirby. Um, after you guys won the national championship last year, did you reach out to any other coaches, maybe even in different sports, who had won a championship and then ask them their approach to the following season, like if, you know, how they approached it, that type of thing? No, we have uh, a couple in-house sports psychologists that we talked about how the mighty fall and uh, some business structures, you know, the blockbuster model and uh, some different models where, you know, ego got the best of uh, organizations in the business world, the corporate world, but uh, didn't reach out to many, many coaches. I, I had experiences at Alabama and I knew the kind of year it would be. It's always a little tougher to bring everybody back to home base. It was much easier for us this year because we had so many players leave and we had a, a hungrier uh, young team.